Yes, hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here because I do think a new paradigm for world peace is possible. And uh, I'm very happy this address is 15 years after September 11. So we need to reflect on this. Albert Einstein said, World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. And therefore it's very concerning that uh, people like the Pope are saying we are already in World War III, which is for in a peace ill way. We've been thinking about peace very much in terms of security blocks such as NATO and Warsaw Pact. Uh, we've been thinking in terms of balance of power, of mutually assured destruction, and in terms of competition between countries such as USA and China. We've always been thinking that it requires power basically to ensure peace and so we have thought about ways to create power basically and this is by means of weapons by means of information asymmetry and by means of the money system and i will go into this let's start with information asymmetry People say knowledge is power, and that's the reason why actually governments and also companies have been starting to collect a lot of data, as much data as they can get. Because the dream is, if we just had enough data, then basically the truth would reveal itself and data would tell us what to do. We just had to do it. And the idea came out that we could build something like a crystal ball that allows us to see what's going on in the world any place in real time and maybe even predict the future and in fact military circles around the world are working on the creation of such prediction machines and this is leading to war games on the grand scale the idea is we could now optimize the world so could one now rule the world like a benevolent dictator that's the question and one of the masterminds of this is Brzezinski, who came up with this book, The Grand Chess Board. So people like him think, no, basically ruling the world is like playing chess. You just need to know which piece to move and how to do that. And in fact, uh, we know that computers are better chess players since quite some time, so basically people would build the best chess computer to rule the world, right? And um, in about 20 years' time, people expect that computers would overtake humans in terms of intelligence and capabilities, and basically controlling the world would come down to creating a huge chess computer, in a sense. And a chess computer would play with all the countries around the world, and in fact, with everyone. So the question is, could society now run like a giant machine? If we wanted to do that, we would need to know what are all the different pieces that society is made up of. Um, this is us, this is companies, this is our political parties, this is our countries, and so on. And we would need to know how to manipulate those pieces. And in fact, this has been happening for some time. Chile was actually the first country to build a cybernetic society back in 1973. Um, that regime was basically overhauled by the CIA back on September 11, 1973. But the idea is lived on. And for example, they have been taken up in Singapore, where they have also learned basically how to make experiments with people and manipulate them. Uh, this is happening now everywhere around the world. Something that I'm discussing in my new book, The Automation of Society, is next. Now, how is this working? Basically, people use machine learning, deep learning algorithms that they run on big data, big data that has been collected about the world, about everything, and actually personal data, your data, data that has been collected 
without your agreement, without your knowledge, but it's there. And they run this machine learning on that data in order to find out what you're doing and how you can be manipulated. And Google was one of the first companies to learn how that can be done. Of course, they came up with personalized information, with personalized advertisement that basically steers your attention and can influence your decisions, your emotions, your behavior. So, are we remotely controlled? That's the question. And if you look at pictures like this, you could think, well, maybe there's something to it. And if you search on the internet and you find a couple of documents that will show you that, in fact, that's the intention to control our behavior and our thinking. So companies and governments have tried to build a matrix that would basically control how we would see the world and that would control our behavior. And one of those companies manipulating our thinking is Facebook, which has imperial ambitions, as the economist has stated, and it's not the only company, actually, uh, that has these ambitions. So IBM was proposing their Watson computer for president. And Google actually wants to reprogram the state so that they're working on an operating system for society, an operating system for the world. And it seems like CERN is also one of the players in this area. So, connected to this idea that we can now optimize the world and we might rule the world like a benevolent dictator, the future of democracy has been questioned. Is it an outdated technology? In fact, this kind of thinking, I believe, has brought democracies around the world under pressure. And we've seen that in Turkey recently, we've seen that in Poland, in Hungary, even in France. And I think democracies around the world are in danger. So it's time to say stop. And not just because we don't like this development, but it's not leading to a better world. The world is not a chess game, you know. If it was a chess game, it would rather look like this, you know. Nobody could understand that game. And by the way, <laughs> the rules are changing as we go. And that's why we have a broken chessboard. Now, I really have to comment on the feature of this linear thinking that has been guiding our politics and business for many years. So that basically is behind this top-down control thinking, because hierarchies behind supply chains and all this. But now we are living in a different world, in a networked world. And that means that basically things come up differently from what we expect. We cannot shoot in a straight way, in a sense, you know. So uh, there is an intended effect, but instead what happens in those highly networked and complex systems is that there would be side effects, there would be feedback effects, and there would be cascade effects. So something very different will happen. And cascade effects uh, can undermine the very basis of our societies. So sometimes a more decimal perturbation or disruption would impact other systems or other parts of the system and eventually would really mess up the entire system. And can in fact mess up in a globalized society the entire planet. And this is the danger. And in fact, this has happened since September 11. The wars on Afghanistan and Iraq didn't have the expected outcomes. Instead, international tension has been spreading to countries like Syria. It's created an even bigger mess, uh, danger to world peace. Drone strikes have hit also civilians, made many people angry. It created new terror and it created a refugee crisis. So while the paradigm is actually that order would rise from chaos, 
you've seen instead that this really didn't work. Instead, chaos resulted from chaos. And the reason is the following. In physics, we know this law of actio equals reactio. When it comes to violence, actually, we have this law. Actio equals reactio plus epsilon, the coercer and punishment. And that creates escalation. And escalation creates uncontrollable situations. We've seen that in Ferguson, that social order can't be just created by power. In fact, power requires trust. And that requires public support. And that's why now Ferguson has a new black police chief. In fact, we know that since quite some time, for example, the movie The Gatekeepers has come to similar conclusions, and it's related to the fact that we're now living in a diverse and mixed world. So, that old paradigm that we could create social norms by force, that's only working in homogeneous societies. In heterogeneous societies, instead, we'll find conflict. So, the success principles of the past are creating the failures of today. In fact, so far, big data and powerful technologies have not solved our existential problems, such as climate change, financial, economic, and spending crises, conflict and war, mass migration, terrorism. And the reason is, they all have one root cause that we haven't been talking about enough. Our main problem is the lack of sustainability. And in fact, we know that since a couple of decades. The Club of Rome report, The Limits to Growth, has shown this. In fact, the implications were shocking, because no matter what parameters they chose, they always found a collapse of the economy and of population, so, this is something that might happen in the future, and that's very concerning. In fact, the pandemic is preparing for a mass civil breakdown for such reasons. So, do we need to learn to die in the Anthropocene? Well, that obviously is raising some very serious ethical dilemmas. You know, if people have to die, would have to die, like billions of people, according to these predictions, you know. Who would die? Who would have to die? Who would decide that and how would it happen? And these are the things that come to mind. Global war, global pandemics, uh, and a lot of really terrible things that we don't want to experience in our lifetimes. But I do think there are actually some options that we haven't seriously considered so far. And I will talk about them later on. First, let's go into this one-dimensional money and fiat currency system. You know, it served us well for quite some time. You know, we had a luxury life. Where it was like we could create money like magic. We could print it, you know. And that has created inflation, but it also has also created debt in industrialized countries that we can't pay back, and it has created an overuse of the resources of this planet. And as we have been overusing those resources, they've been lacking elsewhere, and that created conflict, and that created war, and mass migration, and terrorism, all the problems that we now have today that come back like a boomerang to us in this highly networked world. Now, it's really time to overcome the system, you know. Uh, this problem of the debt cycles is known since 5,000 years, so it's time to innovate this. You know, money is a coordination system to decide if um, there are limited resources, who would get how much of one resource. And, well, basically you can imagine that we could build a thousand different coordination systems, much better coordination systems, but it's not happening um, because well, there are people behind that money system that have an interest, actually, in what is happening. Because the central banks, I'm sure you know this, are owned by private people. So whenever 
Governments make debts, they earn the same amount of money. So, you know, our debts make them rich and powerful. And in fact, it turns out it's the same kind of people who are behind those companies that are pushing for those international free trade agreement. And the idea is that uh, basically monopolies would create economies of scales and times of scarcity, that would be the best solution. But in fact, I'll tell you later on that what you really need is a circular economy. And the very same people also apply this principle of divide et imperum. So basically, they're selling weapons to two sides and the steer war between those two sides. So basically, everyone else would be weak and then they could create their order imposed on the system. So do we really need to live in a system where some people don't have enough money to survive, but too much to die. Why is it that uh, we have an economy that matches supply and demand only on average, but people are suffering on both sides, some of obesity, some of hunger, even though there is really enough food in the world for everyone. So what I believe is we really need a new paradigm of thinking, as Albert Einstein has told us, we cannot solve our problems with the same kind of thinking that created that. We need a paradigm shift, we need to change our thinking, we need a transformation. And I have a dream. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to address people we don't like. That really doesn't have to be like that. Now, why aren't we changing the game? I think now, now is the time where there's no choice. We have to change the game because it's a matter of survival for billions of people. We cannot just let things happen as in the past. It would work out for the world and for us. And in fact, uh, if you like, you can have a look at this paper, Why We Need Democracy to the Throw and Capitalism to the Throw to Survive, which is addressing these questions. I personally believe that we are now just at the beginning of a grand transformation of our society. And in fact, it will be a triple transformation, a transformation of our world financial system, an ecological transformation, where we basically have to, uh, to go towards a low carbon economy and also learn to recycle resources, otherwise we would uh, end up in resource shortages and that would create conflict and war. And you'll see the digital transformation, but that enables us actually to do those other two transformations. So they will be intertwined. So let's go towards the discussion of this finance for the O system that I have in mind, that we can now build by combining the Internet of Things with blockchain technology and complexity science. And I think it's now possible to marry different principles with each other through those technologies and science. And we can build an efficient system that is at the same time liberal, participatory, social, democratic, and ecological. And we have to do that because we have to build this circular economy that would reduce resources so we wouldn't run into these terrible resource shortages that would lead to this economic and population collapse I mentioned before. So I think we can avoid it in this way. And the sharing economy that's now coming up would be part of this circular economy. So basically this would allow many more people to live uh, in high quality living conditions with less resources. So how do we get there? Well, here's an idea. We started to build a platform called NervousNet just in the beginning, and I'd like to invite you to all participate. It's an open source project. And this is basically using the Internet of Things and it's creating a citizen web. So we will allow everyone to create data and citizens to control that platform. So it would use the sensors that are in your smartphone and maybe additional sensors and we would connect those smartphones with each other to jointly build a global measurement system. 
And you're in control, we're concerned about your privacy, your informational self-determination, all that is taken care of. Now what can we do with this in perspective? We could measure externalities such as noise, <coughs> CO2, pollution, unemployment, um, waste, all these kind of things that we don't like to have. That would get a cost. And uh, on the other hand, we could also measure those things we'd like, such as cooperation, reuse of waste and resources, uh, happiness, uh, health, new jobs, and so on. So they would get a value. And in fact, you know, based on all those externalities that we would measure in a crowdsourced way and share with other people, so those data would be available to everyone, we could build on top a multi-dimensional incentive system that basically encourages the reuse of those resources, encourages cooperation, encourages, uh, in, in fact, uh, rewards um, products that are produced in an environmental friendly, socially friendly way. And this system can now be built, as Bitcoin has shown. We can build the system, we the people. And in fact, uh, as we create these data and share this data, we would also create money and earn money in a bottom-up way and it would eventually rise to the top, of course, but it would work much better than the system that we have today where the central banks are trying to restart the economic engine, but even though they're pumping billions and trillions into the system in a top-down way, they haven't managed to do so. In fact, we now have a level of inequality that's actually holding back economic growth and prosperity. So the only way to change that is to produce money in a bottom-up way. So I do think, I'm convinced, and the Pope has uh, said something similar, by the way, that we need to have reforms of international institutions like those shown over here. And here's a proposal on how to do that. So we basically could have Parliament, where we have not only political representatives and business uh, who basically uh, try to uh, make them do what they want, but business would be represented officially there, science would be represented, and citizens as well. So, now let's come to democracy 2.0 and governance 4.0. We're living in a world that is so complex we cannot understand fully. Nobody can, and no supercomputer can. And so basically what we really need to do is to bring the knowledge and ideas of many people together. And that requires online deliberation platforms where we can put the arguments on the table, on the virtual table, where they can be sorted in order to flesh out different perspectives on a complex problem. And then once that has been done, we can have a round table basically to integrate those different perspectives and come up with solutions that meets several of them, that works for many stakeholders. That is really important, a pluralistic approach. And why is this important? Because in these complex problem solving, actually, it's diversity that wins and not the best. Have a look at Wikipedia, Netflix Prize, I will see that basically the very best teams have been unable to solve the challenge individually, but when they started to average their solutions with other teams, teams that haven't been as good as they've been, altogether they created a better solution. You know, we would have just expected the opposite, right? So it's really important to have diversity and integrate the risk perspectives to come up with good solutions. And in fact, we know that the most diverse economies are the most successful ones. And that requires freedom, because freedom promotes creativity and innovation. And it requires value pluralism. It's not good to maximize one quantity such as efficiency. There are many other things that matter. 
And that's why you know, this one-dimensional money system is so bad, because we are trying to project the complexity of the entire world from just one dimension, while there are so many other dimensions that matter. So it's really important that we have these integrated solutions. And here, digital assistants can actually help. So, um, reputation systems are systems that can actually help to create peace in the multicultural world. I told you before, force cannot create social order, but there's a new mechanism that has spread quickly on the internet, um, which is reputation systems. And in fact, think of digital assistants that we can now build that would help us to achieve our goals. In fact, uh, could advise us, uh, they could raise our situational awareness, they could help us interact with other people, in particular people with different backgrounds, maybe from different cultures, so they could help us to overcome cultural barriers. Like real-time translation is just a simple example, but imagine we would have this digital assistant that explains us how different cultures work, how people think and feel and how to interact with them, and the fact that we could eventually learn to unleash all the potential of all those rich cultures around the world, because cultures are made of, of thousands of success principles. If we would just operationalize and understand them, you know, we could recombine them in new ways to come up with new solutions and new value. In fact, this new age that is now coming, the digital age, that is basically very much built on information, that is immaterial, this is unlimited, there are really potentials for everyone. If we build the system in the right way, everyone could be rich, and it's important for this that it would create new opportunities for everyone. So, in this NervousNet platform, for example, uh, people can create data, but it will also create data that people could analyze, so that would be open for that, and also everyone could create Internet of Things applications and services, and so on. And those systems would also increase awareness. We would be able to see things and understand things that we can't see with our five senses, right? That such as social capital is this immensely important for our economy and society, reputation, trust, solidarity. But so far, we have difficulties measuring it, and that's why it's often damaged, sometimes intentional, sometimes unintentionally. But once we understand and can measure the value of this, we'll learn to protect it. So, if we create new opportunities for everyone to take better decisions, to coordinate each other better, to cooperate, uh, to be more creative and innovative, you know, that will in fact create a better world. And what it needs is an open and participatory information, innovation, production and service ecosystem, a giant sharing economy 2.0 that's owned by all people. And so we could plug in with our own ideas and services and products, and for this to happen, we require interoperability. So combinatorial innovation and co-evolution can happen. Coming to the end now, we must now learn to love our planet and everyone living on it. Because we are all interdependent. It's one giant ecosystem. Whatever we do comes back to us sooner or later. And in fact, also Brzezinski has understood that. So recently he said, you know, global dominance doesn't work. We need global realignment. And how could that happen? Well, only by overcoming blocks based on shared values. And of course, we would need to discuss about these values that uh, we would share. But I think as data becomes more important and information becomes more important, also ideas and values become more dominant. So it's time to act. We now need to build this society here for the now. We have the science, we have the technology, we have 15 years, and we need you, visionary, courageous people, to create a suitable framework for society for the development.
Now, about a year ago, on November 9, 2015, I've indicated that we would see democracy through the digital democracies come up around the world. Today, on September 11, 2016, 15 years after this big attack on September 11, 2001, I'd like to express my confidence that we'll see an era of peace coming soon as we understand what creates war and what creates peace. So for this, a great revelation is needed. So I'd like to ask you to go out and reveal what's wrong in this world and to say what needs to be changed and how it can be done, then we'll soon live in this world. Thank you very much. Thank you all.